the one thing that sucks about cars and coffee is that, for me anyway, is it's, it starts at 8. If I want to take any back roads, I've got to leave at like 6.20 in the morning. Getting on my camera gear. The tripod. Because I'm going to make the resonator delete video on the way back home. And my buddy Ted, who I don't think he's ever experienced a true sports car. So we're going to start him out slow in the GT350. By the way, it's freezing cold. It's like 45 degrees and we're freezing our nuts off. And the GT350 is super dirty. Well, for my standards anyway. You ready for this, Ted? I'm try. <laughs> you ready to be YouTube famous? YouTube famous. Alright, so we're on the highway heading to Cars and Coffee. So Ted told me, I asked Ted what's the fastest he's ever gone. <laughs> and he said, I don't know, 80? <laughs> so what was your initial impressions, Ted? <laughs> the first turn, you know, the first turn we were doing, you know, 95 at, you know, coming into a sweeping S curve. And then I told him, you know, I'm not a particularly gifted driver, but um, still it was probably more than he's ever experienced. So what do you think, Ted? <laughs> That's ready. We're gonna have to teach him how to drive a stick. That'll be a future video. I feel like such a red-blooded American rolling with another uh, Mustang down the highway. Doing a... <laughs> Although I'm not really into doing pulls against a, a car that I know that this car is faster than. It's kind of pointless, but... Anyway, interesting. So... This is a first where I have to park in the American car area. I'm gonna alienate. I'm gonna have to edit all this out, Ted. What's up, man? I'm taking Ted to his second experience. The most delicious barbecue in the world. Ted, I'm gonna make you world famous at Four Rivers. Ted's gonna start his YouTube channel after this tomorrow. I don't know what he's gonna do it on, but he's gonna do it on something. So if you've if you live in Orlando or have never been to Orlando and are coming to Orlando, you need to go to Four Rivers. It's so good. Uh, I'm a Yankee, but I can appreciate some good barbecue. And this is a, I think, Orlando only. Uh, there's three or four of them in town. But I mean, Ted and I are going to go check it out. And so the intention here today, what I'm going to do is um, me and uh, me and Ted are gonna go drive the back roads and then I'm gonna stop and do an exhaust video. Uh, but I'm gonna talk more of a, like just a basic video, just talking about the basics of, of the, the GD350 and really just the basics of sports cars in general, manual transmission and stuff. All right, people, we're on my special back road spot. And my good friend Ted here with me. We're gonna take you through well, one, the back roads, and then secondly, just the, I'm going to sort of talk Ted through through some of the basics of you know, this car and I guess just sports cars in general. Whatever comes to my head is usually what I end up talking about. First, let's get rolling. Ted, this is called going around a turn. <laughs> so I've had the car now for 1,400, almost 1,500 miles. So I've had it for about five or six weeks. And you know, the first week, of course, which I've got tons of flack for spending the week you know, dialing in the paint but now that the paint's dialed in I've, I've only washed it a couple of times since but you know it looks good um now all i have to do is just maintain it you know, hopefully i won't have any incidents where i have i had a bunch of contamination on the coat of wax that i put on 
the top layer, so I had to take that off and, and do it again. Um, but the you know the paint's dialed, the exterior's dialed. You know, car needs washed today, but we just spent the morning at Cars and Coffee, and now we're driving the back roads home, and we're going to go do a, a video of the resonator delete. So now in, in this video, you know, the, the the resonator's deleted, and so the the I got, there was lots of people that were give, busting my chops about going to a muffler shop and cutting off the resonators. And I don't know what people expect. I guess, you know, would you expect me to go to like some sterile facility where there's stainless steel everywhere and like nice shiny floors? And I, I just, I just don't know what people expect when you get, you know, when you want to cut something off of your exhaust, you go to a muffler shop because that's what they do all day. And muffler shops usually aren't the cleanest environments and the guys aren't, you know, they're not road scholars. And so the, the reason why you cut the resonators off this car is because the, um, you know, they're put there for a reason. It's to muffle the sound. It's to make it a little quieter. And so the, the R version, the GD3R, uh, GD350R, uh, which is the sort of step up from this car, has doesn't have resonators. So the first simplest modification to do to the car is to cut them off and just put a piece of straight pipe in. And, you know, I wasn't too concerned about getting some fancy stainless steel. Just whatever they have, just put it on. It really doesn't matter. I mean, first, I'm in Florida, so I'm not dealing with harsh salt and rocks and stuff like it, cinders like I would up north. And so all I wanted to do was just, just wild a piece of pipe in there. I didn't need anything special. Plus, the chances of me keeping this stock exhaust forever is pretty slim. In fact, it's zero because I'm already looking for something else. And so we've deleted the resonators. Of course, I did a I did a, a clutch spring upgrade on this because the the factory clutch, like if you'd felt like if you'd felt what the factory clutch felt like, it was like like light, then heavy, then light. It was just this weird sort of hitch it had to it. So now I have a linear spring, which is just smooth and 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 I'm telling you, man, this is like the easiest car to drive from a gearbox perspective. So from a gear change, a, you know, a rev match downshift gear change, it's, you know, it's one of the easier cars to drive. You know, the first to second transition has always been difficult for me. Um, you know, especially if you're, if you're on the car and you're driving, you know, at, in this car, you know, over 8,000 RPMs and you need to shift the second. Um, some cars like the E92 M3, it's a difficult transition. Uh, but this one's super smooth, so you know, changing gears in it is really, really simple. You know, that, that's a huge plus to this car over really any other car I've ever driven, um, is just the ability to just row through the gears and have really precise shifts, really easy down shifts. Uh, I wish I could heel toe better, but um, maybe someday I'll, I'll figure out how to do it. So, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, Ted's never driven, or you've driven once, but you've never learned how to drive a manual, right? So, how old are you, 19? Oh, shoot, how did, how did you get 22? I thought you were 19. I don't know where you got 19. Oh, I just made that up? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, Ted's 22. Now I feel bad because you should have, you should know how to drive a manual by now. I'm gonna have to teach you on my 500 horsepower, um, you know, GT350. Probably not the best car to learn on. Although I just told you how easy it was to drive, right? Yeah, so maybe, maybe I should, should, maybe I'm gonna have to do that now. But I mean, do you understand the concept? So I'm sure there's a lot of younger people who don't, you know, who haven't driven a manual, and you know, people ask me about, you know, down, rev mat downshifting. So you know, a normal downshift would be you go. So I'm in fourth gear to go to third, and so notice there's a, you know, there's like a, a hitch there. Like if you if you're downshifting, you want to rev the engine and then in, disengage the clutch. And so, one of the really nice things about this car is rev match downshifting is so smooth. Like there's there's a very seamless transition. But you have to really you really want to give it a good throttle blip before you put it in gear. So I find that you know people t that tend to downshift or rev match downshift won't. They'll just they won't give enough gas and then you know you engage the clutch not as smoothly but this like i said the the, the gearbox is so mechanical it's very easy to tell you know, which gear you're going into um, and so when you are rev mat downshifting it's it's simple to do i don't double clutch um 
you don't need to really on a modern car but back in the old days you would need to if you were going to downshift you would you would engage the clutch gear in clutch out clutch in rev match and then let the clutch out so that's what they, you know when they talk about you know fast and furious back in the old days double clutching I mean, you don't need the double clutch anymore because the the, you know, the point of it was to get the synchros lined or to get the you know the gate lined up um, but you know we don't need to do that anymore so double clutching isn't really necessary I know there are a lot of uh, old school you know guys who have been driving a long time you know track drivers and stuff with that with double clutch but I, I don't know how to do it I know how to do it but I can't do it efficiently and it's really unnecessary on a modern car And then when I'm talking about heel towing, like so, you know, some of the turns we've come in, come into, you're gonna brake, right, and then enter. And so what you would normally wanna do is I would wanna, while I'm braking, I wanna get the car in the next gear, but I don't wanna lug the engine, so I don't wanna just put it in gear while I'm braking and let off the clutch and do that, you know, where we, where, where we snap into gear. Instead, I wanna, as I'm braking, and I'm gonna downshift, you know, I would wanna give it a blip of the throttle and then put it in gear so there's a smooth transition. So in order to do that, when I'm braking, you know, when I'm coming up to a corner and I'm under, you know, I'm trying to slow the car down, um, I would wanna turn my foot and blip the throttle, which I'm not very good at. In fact, I suck at it. So I'm coming into this turn, I'm braking, blip the throttle and then downshift. But I want you, you would stay on the brakes if you were, coming up to a turn so you know, I mean coming in you know on the throttle on the throttle on the throttle on the throttle off the throttle on the brakes blip the throttle and then you know then I'm in the next gear so that way you know as I'm coming around the turn then you know I can then roll on the on the throttle again watch how easy this thing is to smoothly transition and I'm never I've never been a particularly gifted driver in general but gear person to operate the gears there's this one goof who makes comments on the videos occasionally they're usually pretty long about you know you know it's there's a you know there's driver education at your local um local community college really you really should teach you how to shift gears like i <laughs> i don't think i'm that bad maybe there's a little self-deprecation there on my part but So this car versus many other cars, we talked about this when we were driving down before, is it, I am working a little harder to you know drive here. You know, I feel like there's a, um, I feel like the car, you know, the magnetic ride is fantastic. So the, you know, the shocks have, you know, like a metal particle inside of the, the you know, so you know, basically the shock works is there's a tube and there's hydraulic fluid in there. and there's metal inside the hydraulic fluid and so then they can control via you know magnets around the shock they can control the stiffness of it and so and it works in real time on this car uh, but so the magna ride makes it a great ride but the car is so heavy that you know at 37 3800 pounds that i can just and part of it's probably my jadedness from driving the gt3 around but i feel like i'm working pretty hard to drive this thing you know what, let's do... Is it really feel like you got a turn? Yeah, I feel like I've got to work to keep the car you know, on the line that I want. Did you, can you, did you notice the, uh, the, the heads up display? The that, yeah, that tells me when to shift. So this car has a you know heads-up display, and there's there's three different modes. There's drag mode, there's track mode, and then there's regular mode. And regular mode kind of goes from left to right and is up on the screen all the time. I've been trying to get used to track mode, where as you get closer to red line, then the the the, the bars come up, and then they go in, and then they you know when they touch, that means you need to shift. Oh, cool. Vintage Porsches.
if you, man, I, I like if you could learn how to drive a stick and you got in and you drove this car and then you got into my GT3, the difference in steering, like the weight of steering, even though this has big old front tires, the two, you know, 295s in the front, um, the, the steering on this car is so light. It, the weird thing is when I'm driving it, it, it doesn't feel light. But then when I get in my GT3 and drive it, it feels like the darn steering wheel stuck. It's so it's so stiff. Um, now there's different modes, but even in even in sport mode, the you know the, the the steering is very different. It's very light. You know, so you know this car, unlike cars, especially you know Mustangs in the past. This has electric steering, so you know the steering rack out front is powered by electricity rather than a hydraulic system. And the problem with electric, you don't get the same feedback. But you know the electric steering steering systems have gotten so much better. The reason why they do it is because it's much more efficient, it's lighter, um, it's much more complicated. But it's a, you know, it's a from a mechanical perspective, it's a simpler system. It doesn't require as big and heavy hydraulic parts in order to steer the car. The disadvantage to that is that you, you're we're basically, we basically have a digital steering wheel versus having a, you know, a traditional hydraulic system. Uh, and so the, both of the cars, the GT3 and this are both hydraulic, or I'm sorry, electric, not hydraulic, but I think they're both pretty good. But I'm not a stealing steering. Like I, I think of myself as an exhaust connoisseur. I'm not a steering connoisseur. There comes the orange dots. That was only 7,000 RPMs, though. That's the really crazy thing about this V8 is it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, you don't realize like a normal V8 will redline at 6,500 RPMs. This thing is just getting started at 6,500. And the brakes, oh, the brakes on this thing are so good. So, you know, up front, they're six piston. I think they're four piston in the rear. Which basically means there's three little circle circles that push on the pad. So there's three on each side that push the pad against the rotor. You know, versus a less expensive car would have a single piston in the middle. You get more distribution of you know weight or force on the caliper. Check out this road up here. Look up the look up the hill at it when we drive by it. It's called Sugarloaf Mountain. I used to ride my bike on this thing. It's freaking crazy for Florida. Look at that. It's pretty crazy for Florida. Trying to be a professional cyclist. And so the resonator delete, uh, in with the windows up in the car, it sounds great. Um, with the windows down and uh, from the exterior of the car, we're about to find out because we're going to make an exhaust or you know, an exterior video of the resonator delete so I can compare it to the regular exhaust. It, you know, there's like a crack that I just don't like. But you get a little bit more low-end grunt, a little more sort of burbles and stuff as you let off the throttle, especially when it's cold. Um, I don't really need all that. I just, I just wanted it to sound deep, but still retain the the uniqueness of the flat plane. Now, I mean, you've heard me told tell the story five times at Cars and Coffee today, but with you know the difference in this motor and the reason why this car is so special or the motor is so special is because it doesn't have a traditional crank uh, it has a so the the motor is uh, the firing order and the way that the motor you know, operates or generates power is very different than most so basically Ford or what I've read or you know talked to or heard talk about is that Ford bought a you know a 458 or they bought a Ferrari V12 that uses a flat plane crank you know that is generally very expensive to, to produce 
Um, so they bought a Ferrari engine and then figured out, you know, how it works and created a V8 around the technology or around, you know, built a V8 around Ford, what Ford had available to them and built it in a fashion where they, you know, it was affordable. And so the biggest difference is, you know, a traditional V8 will have a, you know, you'll have the crank and you'll have the piston or the, the ring and then the piston, you know, the piston moves up and down and then you'll have a counterweight. So you have a weight on the opposite side of it. And you'll, of course, on a, on a V8, you'll have eight of them and then they fire in a particular order. I think it's, let's see, one, three, and five. I, I don't know, whatever. The, the, the two on the ends, uh, they're, they're at top dead center at the same time and the two in the middle. Um, so anyway, the, the pistons, they fire, the firing order is very different. So cylinders one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's a different firing order than on a flat plane where, you know, on a, on a, on a traditional crank, the, the, um, I think the, I think the, the, the rings that the, the pistons are, they are set up at 90 degrees of each other, something like that. Anyway, I'm making it up. But on a flat plane, they're all in the same plane. So they're either zero or 180 degrees. And so the, the way that the pistons fire, and plus there's no counterweight, it's just that it gives this unique sound. And the disadvantage to it is because there's no counterweight on the crank, you get lots of vibration. And so that's where it was so important for Ford to figure out how to control and retain. So I think they have special motor mounts and, um, and then the other transmission is, 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 is a little different. Um, so I think there's lots of um, extra measures that need to happen in order to make sure the car doesn't turn into a rattle box, you know, it just vibrates down the road. But the advantage to it is you can rev much faster because you don't have those big weights, you know, on the, on the crankshaft. So it can be, it can rev much, much higher, but still have displacement. So it's a, you know, it's a 5.2 liter V8 that still revs rather, you know, aggressively at the 8250. And then makes that wonderful sound that nothing else makes on the planet. So you get a little bit of V8 sound with a little bit of, it's Italy, but you can hear the, there's a vibration through the, and you can feel it in the, you can feel it in the clutch pedal, you can feel it in the transmission, but whatever they've done to dampen that, that vibration, they've done, you know, they've done a really good job at it. And what it really comes down to, the whole experience, the whole, you know, the car, driving the car, it's just, it's just great, it's just fun. Is it the best car in the world? I mean, I don't think so, but it's, it's on the list. So I'm in comfort steering and regular suspension. I found that to work the best on these normal roads. And helping me keep the car under control. triple digits fast I mean you can I mean you can certainly have a faster car but I just like I love the fact that there's not a lot of low-end torque you know like my m3 we, we talked about earlier today has so much torque down low and so that you know, the rear end would step out on you and that the beauty of the magic of the m3 motor and why they use it even though it sounds like crap 
is that the torque curve on that on that motor it's the car just pulls all the way to red line um, it's relatively linear for a turbo car and then makes it very um, tunable um, but in comparison you know this car makes much less torque down low but I'm okay with that because I feel like you know it helps with traction and makes it more fun for me to drive anyway see this is where heel towing would come in really handy say lack of low and torque I mean the car's still moving on out even at low rpms this turn is tricky really quick switch back notice that there's not a lot of engine noise in this thing like everything's exhaust out back which is why I still think the E92 M3 sounds better than this car because in the E92 you get a lot of induction noise and exhaust this is just exhaust I mean nitpicky complaint but cyclists coming up over these little hills because you can't see them, they're blind. making spot what are you doing homie guess he's going so from a sports car experience perspective since this is your first experience because that that's that's the my argument with this car is that it adds all of American muscle with a, with a sports car experience. So that's why I think it's so great. Um, so I feel comfortable calling this a sports car. So what do you think? It's your, makes you want a, a real car now? How are you doing as a passenger? See, I get real nervous as a passenger. <laughs> that's not good. That means you'll be much more aggressive than I would be. I'm not riding passenger with you driving, man. <laughs> Ted is a man of very few words, by the way, people. It's not, I'm not dominating him. This is just the way it goes. I tend to surround my people who, surround myself with people who let me do all the talking. I'm digging a hole near my exhaust making spot. What the heck's going on here? I hope they don't mess it up. pulls you back, your foot naturally comes off the gas. You have to keep your foot to the floor. The floor. The floor. 